All right, hey everybody, welcome to the SFR Pulse. I'm Greg Rand. SFR Pulse is a podcast for real estate junkies, and I got myself a real estate junkie on the hook here. Um, <laughs> say hello to Jake Marmelstein. What's up, Jake? How are you? Hey, how you doing, Greg? I'm, I'm good, thanks. Good. Um, we, uh, we have not connected prior to about 30 seconds ago, which is just the way I like it. I like having the initial get to know you conversations right here live on the air. So very little preparation, um, which I think is cool, right? We get a chance to get to know each other. And, uh, especially in times like this, your profile talked about commercial real estate and we'll dig into that. Your profiles talked about leadership. So you're running a business. And so obviously you're, you're focused on how to lead your people. Um, and I'm sure you've got some people out there that you uh, take some cues from that you've learned from because you're a young guy. And, and uh, this is an, a challenging period of time we're going through, right? Leadership really matters in times like this. And I think we're all seeing people who are doing it good and doing it badly, uh, but mostly good. So why don't you give everybody, you know, the 45 second background on, on Jake and what your company does, then we'll dig in a little bit. For sure. Uh, thanks for that. So, uh, I'm uh, Jake Marmelstein, founder and CEO of Groundbreaker. Uh, what uh, inspired me to start Groundbreaker was my experience in real estate, investing and for other people and being able to see the systems that we used in-house and not being satisfied with the technology, not being satisfied with the work that I was doing and wanting to find a better way. So I created Groundbreaker to plug in uh, to a space where I think there's a tremendous void around transparency for investors and um, the monotonous, cumbersome workflow that we all have to go through when we syndicate to outside investors. Interesting. It's so funny how many businesses start by unsatisfied customers, you know, who are trying to do something and, uh, and it's just nobody's figured out how to make it better. And real estate is definitely one of those categories that the professionals in the industry um, – in some way, I'm, my background is mainly residential and residential investment, uh, and the entire industry of residential real estate is mainly focused on um, how to get the other guy's real estate agent to change and change to your company, right? It's all about recruiting and retaining the best sales force. Commercial real estate does a lot of that as well. And so those who have the resources and the sort of position in the organization to innovate are oftentimes innovating on what they can do to attract industry insiders, you know, how to, how to attract salespeople to their business as opposed to how to attract customers. They leave attracting the customers to their, their salespeople, right? So there's so much, so much room to make it better for every aspect of the real estate experience. And you seem to have found a good niche there. Um, so syndicators, are you seeing, let's take me before, before we get into the general thing on the business, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear, first of all, where are you, where are you, where are you sitting today? Uh, yeah, so today I'm actually uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, Okay. Uh, but typically I'm in Chicago. Okay. Did you get out of Chicago to uh, make a little space for the big city, or are you down there visiting family, or what's the deal? Yeah, I'm visiting family. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get outside of the city. It was getting to a point where, you know, days were blending together. I was just like, the city's, you know, there's not much you could do in a city when it's on lockdown, so... Right. It'd be nice to get get some fresh air, uh, be in a more expansive place. You think um, you, you like in the expansive place? You think you might make a change? I, I'm a New Yorker that moved to North Carolina seven years ago, so I'm I'm down here in a pretty easy easy place. Um, how are you finding so lockdown in Atlanta versus lockdown in Georgia? Big di I'm sorry, in uh, Chicago, big difference. Huge. I mean, compared to uh, just like the, the first thing I did, I mean, it's not really like really that opened up different than Chicago, but I got to go to a restaurant uh, and have have a beer on the veranda. That was amazing and hadn't done that in two months. I was just like, this is great. I love being able to be like a human being again. Right. Uh, so none of that in Chicago. And there's just more, I think, just more fear and uncertainty Um around in, in, the, in are you in like the city of chicago up there yeah in the so heart of the city in the gold whole, coast like 6 p.m people clanking their pots and pans out the window that kind of stuff that i saw happening in my friends in new york yeah um ours comes in at 8 p.m uh but okay. it's the same thing people screaming and i don't even know anymore 
uh, what it's for. I just think people <laughs> enjoy it. So it's kind of it's fun like to listen to. You have it, right? No matter where you are, 8 p.m. you start screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're weird if you're not careful, Jake. Um, yeah, cool. I don't know. What, what do they do around there? Around uh, up in New York, I've seen the the videos of some friends of mine that they stick their heads out the window and scream and shout. And it looks – it's very different up there, New York being a hot spot. My friends and family are mostly up that way. And um, it's it's not anything like that down in here in North Carolina. We're not a hot spot. And so um, we just got opened up. This is – we're recording this on May 13th. We're like four days into phase one reopening. So like people mm-hmm. are going to the stores again. Um and you can see it on the roads. It's gotten a lot more crowded. So I I was taking a ride every day. I'm working from home. I was heading out every day after work, just driving around and popping into a store if we needed something. But it's like double the congestion on the roads than there was before there was ever a coronavirus. So like it tells you that there's a lot of people that just weren't budging, that were really locked down. But it does, it's not the same thing when you have a state that's going to have a total of a few hundred deaths compared to what's going on in New York. You know, it's just it's not that big of a deal down here. So I feel for the folks in the big city because it weighs on you. You know, the your psyche when you're you see somebody else and they're they're not just another human being, but they also could be a carrier of a deadly disease. There's a there's an apprehension. People don't even want to make eye yeah. contact these days. You notice that people are like they kind of like it's like it's not going to go through the it's not going to happen that way. <laughs> no, don't worry. But um, yeah, it, it's it's crazy because I'm very like warm and friendly kind of guy. So I I naturally just want to like shake somebody's hand, give them a hug or whatever. But so it, for me, it doesn't kind of come naturally to even think about this situation. But right. I'll, I'll tell you, the psyche changed when I when I came uh, outside of Illinois and got outside of that that hot spot. And now I'm in a place where I feel a little bit more relaxed. Good. So, good. Well, you look relaxed. That's good. You know. I don't like tense people on my <laughs> podcast, Jake, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, so I'm really curious because we're, you know, you, you run a business. Give me a profile. How many people do you have over there? Uh, so we're about 10 people Perfect. and um, everybody's here in uh, in the United States, um, in, uh, in Illinois. Uh, at this point, everybody's working from home. Uh, we stopped working in the office in the month of March, maybe March 15th. Uh, we waited as long as we really could, and um, yeah, we've got uh, we've got people across um, customer support, product, engineering, marketing, and sales. Uh, that's basically the departments of the company, and um, everybody's been working hard um, with regard to this whole situation. Um, it's it's kind of hard to manage uh, separating your life when you have your personal life and your professional life and they're both held in the same place. Uh, but I'm used to working from home. I did it for three years. Uh, so this isn't really a big difference for me, but um, we've had to do a couple of things at the company to just be able to re- take a break, enjoy time. Um, so we have like team lunches, we have team happy hours that are done virtually, stuff like that, you know? Um, and uh, and there's And I've told people on the team like, you're going to be here for a while. So why don't you just let me buy you a standing desk and let's get used to this. Cause it's going to be like this and we got to prepare and make sure that we're comfortable where we are. Good. Cool. That's good. You know, that, cause that, that I mentioned a moment or two ago that the um, leadership really matters when it's tumultuous, right? Like we've all been through a stress test now and somebody asked me recently, um, you know, aside from the fact that there are people who are actually losing their lives to this and losing their businesses and everything. Um, But they asked me, is there a silver lining? Are you seeing any silver linings um, around this? So like, you know, they disclaim it, like we're not making light of it, but my family hasn't been impacted personally on this. But anyway, when you think Mm -hmm. about what the silver, one of the silver linings that I can see is that I'm really impressed by the level of um, professionalism and leadership that I'm seeing and, and, courage that I'm seeing come out of people in this. You know, I, I lead a national team and um, there's a few hundred of them out there and we needed our people to keep moving forward even though uh, nobody really knew what was going to happen in April. And then as soon as April came through, no one knew what was going to happen in May. Uh, and then we don't know what's going to happen in June. And so this is, there's this burden of trying to figure out and play this chess game of if this, then that, and if that, then what about this, you know? Um how are you guys 
how is your business being impacted by this so far? Um, and what are you doing to try to, you know, pivot if necessary? So what we ended up doing was we have a very, uh, a very interesting opportunity because Groundbreaker is essentially a new data store, a new system of record for your business that when you're raising money, managing investments in a portfolio of properties, you can have a system that stores everything in the cloud that's searchable, that's easier to find and track information, and it can be used to collaborate with different people on your team. So it actually, this situation prompts a lot of people to think about the way that they're doing things and to look at their cost centers. Um, and so my software actually is more sought after now really? uh, in today's market. But as a way of dealing with that increase in demand um, and also understanding the way that people operate, uh, they might be looking to use a software solution, but they don't necessarily have the money to buy an expensive solution. So we made our pricing affordable, dropped it down by equity under management, so there's different tranches of pricing depending on how much you manage. So we made it as low as $100 a month um, currently. It may not stay there forever, but we currently dropped it down. We put our demo videos online so people can go and watch them on their own. So even though our pricing is lower, our sales cycle is a little bit easier on our sales team so that uh, people can get more educated on their own before they get on the phone with us. And those conversations are more productive, leading to a tighter sales cycle uh, with more informed uh, prospects evaluating our solution and some people signing up through the website on their own. That's so awesome. I can't say that it's, you know, like we're not benefiting. Uh, we were always set up to be able to benefit from the trends in place, the way that work is moving more remote, um, the way that everything is moving into the cloud and the way that software is being developed to automate and streamline more things that are administrative and manual in every other industry. Real estate's just a little bit behind the eight ball. And so they, uh, I think, you know, now is a good time for people to be aware that this technology exists, reevaluate things and maybe move into a, a more efficient piece of technology that's going to help them um, now and after this whole crisis it's interesting so yeah there are a lot of people that on lockdown started figuring out how to improve their business because there wasn't much to do in the business and so it was time to work on it and uh you know the ability to sit down and lock yourself in to hours worth of research to figure out you know how to replace a clunky old process with some new technology i can think of a couple of examples of people that have either decided they were going to learn something new that was going to require half a week's worth of research and they just kept putting it off. And now they had really not as much to do right now because they were on lockdown. Our business wasn't like that because we were, we were uh, scrambling and hustling to try to keep, um, keep our customers, figure out how to do uh, our business um, in a remote scenario. But that's pretty cool that you, you know, you've got people who are trying to improve. So they other, on the other end of this, they come out better stronger, faster, more efficient, and your technology is something that they're they're finding their way to during this this period. Interesting. Yeah, it's like if, if you think about like race car driving and you're driving, uh, you know, 100 miles an hour going into the curve, maybe you're thinking that you're going to be able to um, maneuver ahead, but really we got to be doing right now is like slowing down ahead of the curve so that you can take it and then by the end of the curve, you're pushing the accelerator down so you can go out ahead of everybody else much faster and stronger than ever. And so I kind of equate it to that. Uh, are you a car guy? Sort of, are you a car uh, guy? <laughs> I, I like cars, but maybe not. I don't know if I can that get That analogy. I, I mean, I do some, um, some stuff on the track. And that analogy, some people may not understand that, yeah, you've got to get all the momentum off of the vehicle on the way into the turn. As soon as you can see your way around it. You do the counterintuitive thing, which actually becomes very intuitive once you do it, because if yeah. you come into these things and you're on the brakes, that's when you lose control. But if you're on the accelerator, you pull through it. That's a good analogy for businesses. Get ready and then hammer it when you know where you're headed, you know? Makes sense. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, don't take credit uh, for that one. I read it in a great article I could send you later, but you know, 
it's a, it's a good analogy and that's kind of what I think of uh, nowadays because uh, yeah, you could go, you know, a hundred miles per hour. And in this scenario, even if you're dealing well, uh, cash flow wise, it's just wise to take this time to sort of collect your thoughts and uh, prepare. Um, so, so the commercial real estate, the, the kind of deals that you do, or do they tend to be, um, what food group are they in? Is it office, retail, hospitality, residential, multifamily? What are the, is there any one or two or three categories that you tend to see most of the action in? We, uh, we see a lot of multifamily deals right now on the platform and it's an asset class that you know, is protected um, pretty well by the demand that people have to always live somewhere. Um, office, we have a lot of um, commercial, re like retail and strip center type stuff. Um, there's some folks that do single family actually um, and portfolios, single family homes. And we see some industrial self storage stuff. Uh, and there's a little bit of ground up development, um, but not, not that much ground up development. But yeah, it goes across every asset class. It's interesting when people start thinking about what it's going to be like on the other end of this. One of the things that is a common observation is um, people that never did a lot of online shopping are doing a lot of online shopping right now. People who never worked from home are working from home right now. And you wonder how much of that is going to persist afterwards. Do you Are you picking up any signals from the office or shopping center side of the world that uh, they may have some trouble and they have to find a way to adjust. Oh yeah. I think there's going to be uh, a lot of adjustments that will need to be made for the foreseeable future because you're just not going to get the same kind of foot traffic that you once had. Um, and then for companies that might decide that they want to work from home, do a remote uh, policy, that's going to become more and more popular. We've already seen some of the large tech companies do that, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of a lot of businesses are thinking about that right now, thinking about ways that they can cut costs, um, save on expenses, and then also be able to operate in a remote way. So once we go remote and it's working, and we prove to ourselves that we can work remotely, um, we may incorporate going back to an office, but it just won't be the same. So this really uh, shifts things for those uh, those landlords uh, and I think they they need to be able to adjust um, I don't know how exactly that is is going to happen um, we're starting to see a shift in so our profile because we don't know each other very well is renters warehouse is the biggest third party property manager for single family rentals in the country and they bought my company last year which was called own America which was an online platform for folks to buy and sell portfolios of single family rentals. So we've, we took an online transactional platform and layered it on top of a property management company. Um, and a big part of our workforce, we manage 22,000 houses. So a big part of our workforce is centralized in, um, in call centers in Minneapolis and Phoenix. And those people work in a, in a cube farm, you know, with their headsets on and customers are calling because the dishwasher busted or um, making a call inquiring about, um, you know, making a payment or whatever. And uh, so our operations department and IT department had to go remote, like practically overnight. So luckily we had the technology to be able to do that. Everybody grabbed their computers, headed home and productivity has gone up in every KPI that we measure from that department. And we're like, okay, um, there are some reasons that have to do with some new technology that just got installed in January and rolled out that might've credited that. But, like literally the guy in charge of customer service said the people who used to sit next to each other are collaborating better now than they were when they were three feet away. Like, like I don't know. We don't know. We don't know exactly what it is, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to find out. And it's going to be interesting as you know, those places are going through those, those releasing the lockdown restrictions and they're able to go back into the office again. And we're, we're looking at it going, do we need 20,000 square feet in Minneapolis for that call center? Or is, you know, who would like, you know, everybody raise your hand if you'd like to stay working from home. And we're wondering what we're going to hear from that. So um, what's interesting is that some clients have emerged because we deal with a lot of mom and pop retail investors, but also on the other side of the spectrum, we deal with some institutional 
there's a big institutional trend in single family real estate that only emerged six, eight years ago. There's a whole new wave of institutions that are looking to build substantial mm -hmm. portfolios of single family rentals. And the ones that are showing up this year um, have big office portfolios or big shopping center or hospitality portfolios who haven't done single family who are now saying, all right, we've got to get into that because there may be some erosion in, in our other core business and we got to get into something. You know, everybody's being told you can't go to the store or the restaurant or work. You have to go home, <laughs> right? And that's what that's where you've got to go. And so homes, apartments, um, all that stuff, you know, this ultimately bodes well for that. Uh, and so the adjustments in commercial real estate are going to be interesting because there may be a no turning back kind of a situation. Yeah, I'm now as you say that the wheels are turning in my head and I'm thinking those guys are going to get into single family and uh, they're going to add their office. Maybe they're going to add their office touch because you go to an apartment uh, in the city or even a single family home and you can usually hear voices uh, inside of your own uh, dwelling with two people if you're you know, living with a partner. Uh, they're having to work from home. You're having to work from home. It doesn't work. It is really hard to do. You have to be in separate rooms, and maybe one of the person is working in the closet because that's the only place they can go where they get protected from, you know, the noise from from uh, from both people talking on the phone. So there's going to be changes uh, to. I mean, I think that's like the next step, like changing the actual layout of what homes feature so that they can have work from home setups. Yeah, uh, those I mean, pods, right. four whatever they are. That the, four bedroom houses on the new three bedroom house, right? Because you got to have. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's these there's these pods they sell too, where you can go into like a little two two foot by four foot like pod and have a conversation, and and they're amazing at uh, trapping sound. So maybe those those will start to sell more. I, I don't know. Um, well, it's interesting. We're definitely yeah, I got my kids. We got. I have two two high school age kids, and I got them both. Um, um, what do you call it? Robin Hood accounts last week because they were starting to talk about. They've been talking about trading stocks, and I hadn't gotten my button gear to give them. You know, set them up with accounts so they could go and do it. But we had a conversation at dinner about which companies. Like they're all taking taking classes on Zoom, and so they were talking about. You know, we should buy stock in Zoom. And it was like, okay, so what other stock would you buy based upon who's getting beat up right now, but is likely to come back when everything normalizes? So we we're talking about hotels, airlines, like what's not coming back, what's coming back, um, what's going to be fueled by this, and what just got so beaten up by it. Stock price, you know, American Airlines comes down 60%, 70%. Is it going to come back? And if it is, um, what, you know, what stocks should you buy? And it's interesting to watch people. Um, hypothesize on you know or just 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 flex the 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 muscles in your brain about the chess game you know i mean if you if you've built this business what i already know about you is that you play the chess game like you're trying to figure out where's the gap if i do this what might they do well they might do this and if they do that what if i do this right and so you're you're navigating around your competition you're navigating towards your customers you were saying it earlier about how you know, giving your customers enough information to be able to even make up, make the decision. It gets so educated that the conversation with your salesperson is more fruitful, leads to a close more often, or maybe they just like what they see and they sign up and you start finding that a percentage of your sales happen without having a human intervention at all. That's all the mental chess game. And you watch people play it. And I'm impressed with my kids who they're like, well, I don't, I'm not so sure about that, but I can definitely see this. Like um, the uh, we had the whole Airbnb conversation. Like our people, you know, Airbnb got slammed by this. And so we're seeing a lot of Airbnb hosts are coming to us saying, all right, I was making three grand a month on Airbnb. What can I get for this place in a one year lease? Because now it's just crapped out. Like nobody, I can't even do it. It's, it's become illegal in my city to do short term rentals. We can get you sixteen fifty a month. Give it to me. Just, you know, so we have Airbnb hosts making the switch to long term rentals. So you see business creativity coming out of people. Um, any observations that you've made about um, businesses or companies that you see out there that you think are a good buy from the standpoint, not commercial real estate specifically, but a good buy from the standpoint of technology businesses or, or anything else that you've been, um, you've bought some stock in or anything? I'll put you on you the know, spot. I realize that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, 
I, I, I'll tell you, like, one of the things is looking at like government backed companies or companies that are going to get bailed out that you know are going to have to survive because they're so critical to society. Uh, those are great, like, especially with um, governments that uh, will, you know, will, will act. Um, if like the United States, I, I, I mean, American Airlines, you touched on it, United Airlines, uh, those I would, I would totally uh, be buying them. Uh, because I know that they're going to go back up. Uh, you know, Zoom is an obvious one, um, but maybe like look thinking of other uh, other companies that are going to um, see a rise with with uh, every everything going remotely. One of my biggest um, biggest wins was investing in a government in a in a company that was getting bailed out by the government, uh, and it was. It was actually an oil and gas company. They were getting, they were at like three dollars a share, and they popped back up to like fifteen within twelve months. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think in time, is, like these. Go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just saying in in, in times like like these, like just look at look at what happened in uh, 2008. Yeah. Yeah, my, my industry was 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 first institutionalized after 2008 because people back then had a really hard time picturing the housing market would ever come back. People have a, a mindset sometimes that what's happening right now is what's going to keep happening forever. And so they get surprised when things change. And so, you you know, you um, some of the. Uh, some of the more interesting stories that we see out there, I'm, I'm looking at the permanent behavioral changes in some areas, but then things that are just never going to change in other areas. You know, like I, school is a really interesting category. My kids' schools just, just phoned it in. I mean, they were at school on Friday. They decided to shut down the schools. And on Monday, it was like, okay, well, we used to think it was important to do seven classes a day for an hour. Now we're going to do like one class every three days for 20 minutes. Like what happened, right? What happened to like the bell rings at eight? Life would have been, I would have rolled my kids in front of the TV, in front of their computers and say, okay, you're in school. I'll see you at three o'clock. But they just like, like my daughter's school, they literally dropped the ball so badly that they just said, okay, kids are going to be able to pick. Do you want your grades for the fourth quarter? Or if you want, you can just take the grades you got in the third quarter and just, you can have them for the fourth quarter. So like if you crapped <laughs> out in the fourth quarter, couldn't get up in time, couldn't, couldn't concentrate. Just pick whichever one you want. So we got an email saying we're going to have the grades choice deadline is Wednesday. What the heck is grades choice? We read into it. Or you get to pick whichever you did better you could choose. Um, that's an industry that I don't think is going to be the same because they proved that they – almost everywhere that I'm looking, because I, I do this all day now, right? It's all Zoom meetings. It's all go-to meetings. People have kids in the background. They've got responsibilities to keep an eye on their kids because a lot of their kids – um, you know, the elementary school kids want to be entertained and occupied and their school is not doing it right now. They've instead of going to the typical school day just on Zoom, they reinvented the school day. Uh, mm -hmm. And it caused a lot of people, I think, to question, OK, well, was all that necessary in the first place? And, you know, online schools um, where they can have 500 students in a classroom instead of 25 or 30. Uh, and the cost of which can go down if you're a motivated student, like a college student, right, or a master's degree student, where you're very interested in learning the material. You're not ducking it like I did in school, like, oh, good, Zoom, I can go take a nap and, you know, <laughs> put a dummy of myself on the screen. But if you actually want to learn the stuff, the idea of being able to learn at a massive fraction, you know, huge discount, because the school is able to deliver really high quality teachers, pay them three times as much because they have eight times the student body. Um, and can do it through this channel. That's one of the categories that I'm doing some research on to figure out if that, you know, if the brand of university, which was being kind of beaten up of late anyway, a little bit, you know, big student loans, degrees that aren't worth as much as they used to be. And all of a sudden now I don't even have to go and spend 50 grand a year. I can go spend eight and get an accredited education from my house. Is that going to take hold? I'm curious. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I went to a I went to an Ivy League school, and there was the value work. You know, I got to meet 
the CEO of McDonald's in America, and I got to meet the CEO of Intercontinental Hotels Group and the CEO of Marriott Corporation. And like those kinds of interactions made me think that I could be one of those CEOs, that I could grow and become really successful. And there was never a point in my life where I felt like that other than when I went into those lectures and saw those people come in and speak. So I think it it's just, it's hard for me to relate. I don't know. Um, but I've learned the most I've ever learned in my life is from when I was really motivated to learn it and I wanted to learn it. So if you have somebody who wants to learn, uh, there's no stopping them. In today's environment, they can learn whatever they want with the internet. They don't even need to go to a university. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if a university education is really that relevant anymore, to be honest. Uh, it's just a badge that we put on our resume and after you get your first few jobs, no one even cares about what school you went to, what your GPA was or SAT scores. They yeah, care about what you're doing the and Ivy, what you know. So the Ivy League schools, like where you went, and the schools that really have a concentration in a certain industry, I exempt those from my commentary because the the, the contacts that you make and the um, you know the when you're the best of the best of the best as a university, that's that's one thing. There are thousands of universities out there that don't fit into that category, and so it's just a, it's an exercise in trying to figure out how. What's amazing about this COVID nineteen situation is that it's so compacted in terms of a timetable you know like usually recessions take time to gain steam right stock market craps out for some reason companies start customers human beings start holding back on consumer spending because their confidence gets blown a little while later companies start losing some confidence maybe stop hiring do some layoffs because they see business slowing down maybe home sales start to decline so eventually home prices decline that takes like a year, usually a year and a half. This all happened like in four weeks, <laughs> you know, like stock market crashed on Monday. By Wednesday, the unemployment tripled. Like it's like, what? So um, all kinds of things that might have taken half of a generation to take place are happening more quickly now. And so for, for people that that like to play that chess game and like to try to figure out how to be creative and, and be positioned where the puck is going to go, uh, this is an exciting time on the other end of this. Again, notwithstanding the pain and suffering it's causing for a lot of people. But um, so we're getting close on time here. I want to just say, you know, at the end of this thing, from a, uh, from a leadership perspective, um, mm -hmm. any lessons that you've learned, anything you've seen somebody else do out there that you found impressive, anything that you did with your people that you think really hit the mark, what, what leadership lesson jumps out at you oh. as being uh, powerful? One thing is when this whole when this whole thing happened and shit was hitting the fan, I was like, gosh, what do I do? Um, how do I figure this out? And I thought about all the different things that I could do uh, very quickly. Within like 48 hours, I figured out what the problems were, what I was going to do, and I took swift action. Um, whoever, like, if I needed to cut costs or I needed to... Um, send out you know uh, an announcement to the team um i just did it very quickly and deliberately and did not sit too long on what the decision was that i could do i just took action and i think in a crisis situation you have to do that you have to take swift action resolutely be clear about your your intentions um and and just just do it. You can't, you don't have time to wait and think back and forth about whether, you know, you made the right decision or not. The best decision is not always the right decision. It's the one that, you know, you make. So you have to make decisions and move forward. And I'm a very analytical person. So for me to do that, I was just proud of myself to go through and make those swift moves um, to be able to get the company into a position where I could sleep at night, um, knowing that, you know, I, I I made the right moves and and uh, and and got something done. Uh, so there's companies that I've seen announcing their cuts uh, and you know layoffs in April and May. And it just seems like way too long for them to have to figure that out when the writing was on the wall uh, that things were not going to get better. And so um, and the other thing is just like find you know in times like these where you're really, uh, it, it's hard, it can be very lonely being an entrepreneur uh, and, and a, an executive, owning your own company, uh, you have almost no one to talk to, find a mentor, find an advisor who you trust and like and talk to them 
through the pain <laughs> and uh, and it'll at least feel a little bit better and give you some um, some advice to to help you because that person's already been there, done that. And it's always, just always know that it's going to get better. Uh, it's always going to get better and you're going to get through this. And sometimes it's really hard dealing with the, the situation um, as it is now, but just know you'll get through it. Great. Awesome answer. Jake, um, how do people um, reach you or find you on the social platforms if they want to follow your your progress going forward? Uh, just just go uh, to groundbreaker.co. That's the website, and then we've got we've got Facebook, we've got LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow us there, um, and then on LinkedIn mainly, you'll be able to see some updates. So, cool, awesome, Jake Marmelstein from Groundbreaker. Thank you for being here. Um, appreciate it, man. I wish you all the luck in the world. Stay in touch, uh, and let's definitely stay in touch, all right? Because I'm I'm very interested in uh, in seeing how many of our clients show up out of nowhere that did some syndications on um, strip malls that now want to get into single family that we can have connect with you and vice versa. So I appreciate the, uh, the time today.